Good morning, everybody. My name is Richard Andrews. And I'm the Chief Executive Officer of the Australia-Japan Business Cooperation Committee. Uh, I'm talking to you today from the land of, of the Ngunnawal people, uh, the modern Canberra, uh, and I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land and by paying my respects to their elders, past, present and future, and uh, in particular uh, to the traditional owners of the lands uh, around Australia on which everybody else is attending this event. Uh, I'm delighted to be hosting this event today as part of the AJBCC's contribution to the Japan Aru Festival, which is being hosted by the Consulate General of Japan in Sydney. And I'd like to in particular express my thanks to Kia Sun, the Consul General, uh, for his assistance in putting this together today. Uh, most of all, though, I'd like to thank my good friend, Ambassador Yamagami Shingo, for making the, for making the time uh, to speak to us today. Uh, we've got a great turnout, and that befits the fact that he has become, uh, in the relatively short time that he's been here in Australia, uh, an extremely well-known and, and uh, forceful advocate for Japan's interests in Australia and for the Australia-Japan relationship in, uh, as a whole. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to, to hearing what he has to say today. A couple of housekeeping points. Uh, this is a public forum, so uh, anything that is said is on the record. Uh, there will be an opportunity for questions and answers after uh, Ambassador Yamagami has, has made his initial remarks. Uh, I'd encourage you to participate in that using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screens. Uh, I'd like to now pass over to uh, the Vice President of the Australia-Japan Business Cooperation Committee, uh, Peter Gray, uh, who is himself a former ambassador to Japan, um, and in fact was my boss at the time, uh, uh, and ask him uh, to introduce to us uh, His Excellency Ambassador Yamagami Shingo. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Richard. I hope everyone can hear. Um, the, uh, firstly, before starting, uh, uh, one of the things I want to do is, uh, is once again thank uh, and express appreciation to and congratulate Japan for the Olympic Games. I mean, it's not just the, uh, the sheer number of, uh, of successes they had on the, uh, on the field of play, but also personally the fact that they... Uh, actually agree to continue and commit to continuing uh, to have an Olympics in what could be only described as a fairly horrific uh, background for such a games. I think uh, nothing else uh, actually shows and, and actually pull it off in an effective, efficient, friendly manner says quite a lot about the, the Japanese uh, character and the Japanese nation. So uh, congratulations and best to Yamagami on behalf of uh, myself and I'm sure everyone in the room that you were able to perform the Olympic Games in such a fashion. I, I feel a little sorry that uh, the athletes and others weren't able to enjoy Tokyo, but uh, that will happen at a later date. Uh, it's, um, the fact that we've got 250 participants on this call uh, says a lot about the state of the relationship between Australia and Japan. I think it really is at a, a high point uh, and that high point is going to to to, to expand even further. Uh, it's a uh, it's a relationship whose time has very much come. Uh, it's uh, uh, we're in the situation where uh, the economic interdependence continues to grow. The amount of Japanese investment, which often doesn't get as much attention as it probably should, is enormous and 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 uh, uncontroversial, which is interesting in its own right and very positive, uh, but also the expansion of, uh, of the broader relationships, both the interpersonal relationships, but also the, uh, uh, the strategic relationships. Uh, having a friend, a firm friend in the form of Japan in the current uh, regional situation, uh, where we have difficulties, of course, well known difficulties at the moment with, with China, uh, but there are other more general uh, problems and issues in the region. Uh, and uh, being able to work with Japan, I think, on that is, 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 is a wonderful asset that we, 
that we Australia have. Now, t- turning to Ambassador Yamagami himself, uh, if you have to describe the perfect credentials for a uh, Japanese ambassador to, uh, to Australia at this point in time, Ambassador Yamagami has, uh, has actually got those credentials. He's, he's had postings and gathered experience in all the right positions. Uh, but also, uh, he, uh, he's, uh, he's come to Australia and to Canberra direct from Tokyo. He was Director General of the Economic Affairs Bureau. He was Director General of the Foreign Policy Bureau, Director General of the Intelligence Bureau, all the key jobs in, in, uh, in, in Tokyo and in the, in the Foreign Ministry of the Iron Show are uh, ones with Ambassador uh, Yamagami held and held with distinction. So we've, got, we've actually got a, a star ambassador has been sent to us from Tokyo and, uh, and that has been shown, as Richard mentioned, already in the first six to nine months or so that he's been here. So it's a great pleasure to welcome uh, Yamagami-san to uh, uh, this particular webinar. Uh, the Australia-Japan Business Cooperation Committee will continue to work as closely as we can with he and his colleagues uh, in, uh, in Australia uh, at the embassy uh, and look forward to several more years of, of active, uh, active collaboration. So uh, welcome once again, Ambassador Yamagami, and if I can hand over the microphone or the Zoom uh, button to yourself, uh, and we're all very interested in, to hear what you have to say this morning. Thank you. Well, Peter, thank you very much for your kind and extremely kind introduction. And uh, can I just you know, congratulate you on your work for Nippon Life's MLC, one of the top <laughs> insurance providers in Australia with a history spanning over a century. It's rare to find you know, somebody like you who understands both the risks of our life in diplomacy and the importance of good life insurance. So I might need to speak to you afterwards. <laughs> え、日本の皆様のおはよう distinguished guests, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Today's topic, uh, going for gold, is of course a nod uh, to the Tokyo Olympics, in addition of being a nod to my golden tie. In just four days' time, the Paralympics will take place. I expect they will prove they will prove just as momentous for Australia as uh, the Olympics that preceded them. For Australia. The Tokyo Olympic Games were one of their most successful with 17 gold medals. It was the Olympics that made me realize Japan and Australia truly do have their own complementary strength. For Australia, it is rugby and hockey. For Japan, softball and baseball. If only we could combine our scores on the medal tally These Olympics also reminded me that Australia truly is a nation of incredible swimmers. I often say that Japan and Australia are in the same boat when it comes to diplomatic challenges we face. But Australia's performance in the swimming really made me think there is no better partner than an Aussie to share a rough boat ride with. I was thrilled at the announcement that Brisbane would hold the 2032 Olympic Games. I'm sure there is much that our business community can compare notes on regarding making the most of this golden opportunity. I chose today's topic because I believe that relationship, our relationship has come to exemplify two of the three core Olympic values friendship and respect. This friendship and respect has developed uh, because of the close engagement of our business communities over the past century. 
which is why it is a pleasure to have the opportunity today to address you. It is you, the Japanese and Australian business leaders of today, who are contributing daily to the strengthening of our current and future relationship. Indeed, when we look back and consider the success story of the Japan-Australia relationship, we can see that it was our business ties which laid the foundation for that success. These ties are older than Australia's Federation. They span back 125 years to when Japan's first diplomatic mission was set up in Townsville. Japanese trading houses were quick to recognize the potential of our economic complementarity. Kanematsu, Mitsuyan Co, and Mitsubishi Corporation, for example, set up a presence in Australia as early as 1890, 1901, and 1956, respectively. In the years that followed, all the resources came to dominate the Japanese market. Today, more than half of all Japan's coal and iron ore is bought from Australia, as is almost half of its LNG. Australian agriculture products have been just as impactful. Aussie cheese has captured almost a quarter of Japan's imported dairy market. Aussie beef, almost a half. And sugar has captured more than four fifths of the imported sugar market. Over the past 15 years alone, total trade between our nations has increased by around 60-60%. This was spurred on by the conclusion of our landmark economic partnership agreement in 2014. Today, exports to Japan account for around 10% or $60 billion of Australia's total trade. But what is truly incredible is that investment has grown even farther. In the past 15 years, it has increased sixfold. Today, Japan is Australia's second largest investor with a total stock value of $132 billion. I'm sure most Australians would know of the ICTIF LNG project in Darwin, Northern Territory. That project alone amounts to an investment of 40 billion US dollars. It is Japan's single largest overseas market, overseas investment. Japanese investment into Australia's life insurance sector has also been significant. After Nippon Life acquired MLC in 2016, Daiichi Life, through its sub subsidiary Tao, acquired Suncorp's life insurance arm in 2019. Tao's lion's share of the market will grow even further with its recent agreement to acquire Westpac Life. Japanese companies in Australia have noticeably committed to this country's economy for the long run. They have continued to reinvest the earnings from their Australian businesses, contributing to well over 70,000 jobs. In recent years, Japanese companies like Kirin and Asahi have made long-term investments in beverage production in Australia. Asahi is also investing in one of the largest plastic recycling plants in New South Wales, accelerating the transition to a circular economy in Australia. The economic benefits of our ties have gotten both ways. Without the stable supply of resources that Australia provided, the Japanese economy would not have grown this big or this mature. Australians have today also become an important asset for Japan's tourism industry. Australian visitors are the biggest spenders in Japan with an average of $3,000 per trip. At 13 days, their average stay is also one of the longest. This has led to an explosion of Aussie investment in ski resorts such as Hakuba and Niseko. 
this close engagement between our business communities grew into the roots of mutual trust that anchor our bilateral relationship today. Thanks to this engagement, all that we have in common, our commitment to democracy, human rights, free trade and rules-based international order has become clear. We have become united by shared values. Over the past few decades, our relationship has also expanded to encompass shared strategic interests. In 2007, our prime minister signed the joint declaration on security cooperation. In 2014, the status of our bilateral ties was elevated to a special strategic partnership. This increased security relationship has had a far reaching effect, benefiting our business ties as the trust between our nations grows even stronger. We cannot, however, simply pat ourselves on the back because there is more that Japan and Australia can achieve together. I mentioned earlier that our relationship exemplifies friendship and respect, but there is one final core Olympic value that we are yet to achieve excellence. We need to set our sights on gold. Now is our chance to turn challenges into opportunities. We cannot afford to be complacent. So while we celebrate our success story, we must also look ahead. Our shared values and strategic interests position our business communities as natural partners in facing today's most challenging global issues. These include overcoming the COVID-19 pandemic, preserving the rules-based international order, increasing our economic resilience, and lowering emissions. First, one of our most immediate challenges, the pandemic. Economy around the world, including that of Japan and Australia, have been shaken by the terrible effects of this. As business people, I am sure that you have felt these effects more keenly than most. Japan and Australia are carefully assessing the health situation day by day. As the vaccine rollouts in both our nations begin to gain traction, the resumption of travel is becoming steadily more attainable. All Nippon Airways has of course been doing an incredible job of continuing, continuing flights between Japan and Australia, allowing thousands of Australians to return home safely and vice versa. Our two-way travel is incredibly important for our business ties. Since my arrival in Australia, I have heard countless voices from Japanese and Australian businesses urging the quick resumption of travel for business people. Japan and Australia are looking to resume safe and secure travel as soon as it is feasible to do so. Another way that Japan and Australia have been looking to assist the global economic recovery is by promoting vaccine access in our region. Together with our court partners, Japan and Australia have committed to supporting countries in the Indo-Pacific through this difficult time. Along with the US and India, we will strengthen and assist our neighbors by providing at least 1 billion doses of vaccines. At the Gavi COVAX Summit, co-hosted by Japan in June, both our nations also made significant financial commitments to allow COVAX secure 1.8 billion doses of vaccines for lower income countries. Once travel resumes, I very much hope that many of you will be able to engage more closely with one another than ever before. Because I understand how important that engagement is for our ties. Of course, our economic prosperity is also contingent on the preservation of a rules-based international order. Here too, 
we are facing challenges. But there is much Japan and Australia can cooperate on. Together, we can continue to pursue liberalization and the establishment of fair, transparent rules. Thus far, our shared commitment to the liberalization of trade has led us to cooperate on the establishment of APEC, the conclusion of our EPA, and the entry into force of the CPTPP. But there is more to be done. Our nations can work towards the expansion of the CPTPP and the successful implementation of RCEP. We can engage more at the OECD. Together with Deputy Secretary General Japan's Kono Masamichi, my good friend, I am sure that newly elected Secretary General Matthias Coleman will be a strong positive force for multilateral cooperation. As staunch believers in the rules-based multilateral trading system, our cooperation is also vital for the reform of the WTO, including its dispute settlement mechanism. In bilateral talks last year, Prime Minister Morrison and Prime Minister Suga publicly agreed that trade should never be used as a tool to apply political pressure. This was a strong and clear message Japan and Australia delivered to the world. And it is a message which we continue to underline the importance of the rules-based trading system for decades to come. The pandemic and the growing challenges to the rules-based international order have been a stark reminder of the importance of diversifying trade and fostering economic resilience. By strengthening our trade and investment ties even further, Japan and Australia can ensure that our economies are equipped to face future challenges. For Australian winemakers, there is no better than time, no better time than the present. The time is ripe to double down on efforts to increase the share of Aussie wine in the Japanese market. An Australian wine boom in Japan is possible thanks to our EPA. As of April this year, all tariffs on bottled wine have been reduced to zero. Japanese technology and expertise in the field of infrastructure could also be leveraged more to take Australia's global reputation for livability to new heights. Already, Japanese companies are contributing to the transformation of Australia's largest city, Greater Sydney. Mitsubishi Heavy Industries, SMBC, Hitachi, UR, NAC, and NTT have signed agreements to partner with the New South Wales state government on a range of initiatives. Likewise, Marubeni has helped to significantly shorten commuter times in Sydney's Northwest through Australia's fast, fully automated railway. But opportunities remain. I join many Australians in dreaming of the day when high-speed rail dramatically transforms the way of life here in Australia. Japan's Shinkansen technology could shorten travel from Melbourne to Sydney to just three hours and Sydney to Canberra to just one. When we look ahead to the future, of course, we also think of climate change. With our long history of economic complementarity in the resources sector, we are natural partners in the global endeavor to reduce emissions. In June, we announced the Japan-Australia partnership on decarbonization through technology. This outlined what we had already discovered. Our nations are both committed to a technology-led response to climate change. We believe in the power of innovation. We see hydrogen as our future. By 2030, Japan aims to be using up to 3 million tons of hydrogen each year. By 2050, the goal is to increase this to up to 20 million tons. As such, 
Japan is eager to see Australia succeed in its endeavor to become a world leader in hydrogen production and exports. The 200 Japanese companies that make up the Japan Hydrogen Association are just as eager. Many of them join the dozens of Japanese companies which are backing hydrogen and ammonia projects right here in Australia. In Victoria, Kawasaki Heavy Industries, J Power, Iwatani, Marubeni, and Sumitomo Corporation have commenced a pilot project for the world's first global hydrogen supply chain. In March, I had the pleasure of attending the commencement ceremony for this project, which will use pioneer technology to produce and transport hydrogen all the way from Lateral Valley to Kobe, Japan. In that same state, Toyota has also opened up a hydrogen refueling station to complement its launch of leading fuel cell vehicle on Australia roads. In New South Wales, Idemitsu is supporting the H2N project to transform the Hunter into a hydrogen valley. In South Australia, Mitsubishi Heavy Industries has backed H2U's Air Peninsula Gateway and NLS Corporation is exploring the development of a Japan-Australia CO2 free hydrogen supply chain. And more is on the way. In Queensland, the long list of Japanese sponsored projects is set to grow with Itochu's potential investment in Gladstone. In Tasmania and Western Australia, IHI is working with Australian counterparts to study the feasibility of ammonia production and transportation. Mitsui OSK Lines have also recently announced a MOU with Origin Energy to investigate the potential for a green ammonia supply chain. The vast potential of hydrogen could very well be the key to significant emissions reductions and hail a new golden era for the industries of our two nations. Advances in hydrogen technology through Japan-Australia cooperation will benefit not only our region, but also the world. To conclude, I would like to re reiterate that our shared values and strategic interests can and will help us to overcome increasingly complex global challenges. The close engagement between our business communities over the past century has created a strong foundation of trust between our two nations. Japan values this trust and considers it the greatest asset to our friendship. Over the next few decades, I am confident that together, we will be able to overcome the many challenges we face while taking advantage of opportunities that arise. In this way, we will achieve true excellence and create a new Japan Australia success story for coming generations. Thank you. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Um, uh, thanks. That was a, an excellent. Uh, uh, summary of where we're at with the relationship and some ideas about where to go. Um, if I could remind the audience, uh, the question and answer function is now open um, on the, uh, 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 at the bottom of your screens. We have a couple of questions coming in. I wanted to kick off with a sort of a slightly personal one to the ambassador. Um, you've been an extremely am uh, uh, energetic uh, ambassador uh, since you've been here. I know you've got around to every state capital um, and to some other parts of Australia as well. Um, what's it been like the last little while um, you're sharing this uh, experience of lockdown uh, with all of us now? Um, how are you passing the time? How are you uh, managing to continue to be enthusiastic and effective when you, you must be quite frustrated at all of the things you'd like to be doing, but uh, you can't. And, and maybe, you, maybe you can tell us about a couple of uh, good films you've been able to catch up in the, um, 
in during that time. Well, uh, well, thank you for your kind remarks, you know, Richard. And uh, as uh, you know, uh, all of us, you know, uh, Richard, Peter, and I know, you know, we have spent uh, you know a considerable amount of time in the foreign service. And I think uh, one of the you know uh, requisite you know, ne necessary qualification to be uh, in the foreign service, uh, or in that regard, you know, to work overseas as a businessman, is to keep uh, your intellectual curiosity wherever you are assigned. So suppose you know if you are you know Japanese businessman uh, stationed in Australia, uh, there are so many you know things uh, you need to you know take interest in, including you know its history, you know uh, literature, culture, way of life, uh, mindset. Uh, so in that regard, you know uh, this is never ending uh, story. I have so many books to read, so many movies to see. I just finished reading uh, the novel. Uh, you could call it a non-fiction uh, story, a title or man. This was recommended to me by one of the uh, uh, attorney general uh, in local state. And uh, fascinating book to know more about, uh, you know, uh, how, uh people you know interchange uh with each other uh, in this country so this is one of those examples and uh you know uh i don't have time to sleep you no know? i have uh, so much to learn from australia and this is such a fascinating country thank you Thanks very much. And that, that leads into a question that I've just received from Jason Hayes from uh, PwC, which uh, where he congratulates you on a fantastic overview of our bilateral relationship. Uh, we often speak about the per perception gap that exists mainly from Japan towards Australia. Um, in your travels across Australia, have there been any areas or aspects of Australia that you have been pleasantly surprised to learn about that was a first for you? Well, probably you know this is not necessarily you know restricted to Australia. I know or I've been assigned to you know or some other English-speaking countries like you know United States or you know UK, and uh, uh, actually this is an issue after us. But uh, from time to time, you know, I encounter you know some people. Uh, local people here uh, who do not know much about you know Japan or who do not know much about uh, East Asia. For example, you know uh, in the middle of conversation, sometimes you know uh, they may start you know misspeaking uh, Japan and they may say you know China. So you know on the situation like that, uh, uh, I really feel there is a lot we have to do you know either as a japanese diplomat or a japanese living overseas uh, to share more you know with our friends in australia you know what japan is doing what japan is up to what japan and australia can do uh, together so wherever you go you know presence of japan is you know reasonably you know, significant, and this is a good starting point because there are many Aussies who are so interested in what's going on in Japan and uh, in terms of coming up with a way to promoting, you know, Japan-Australia relationship. So in that regard, I regard everything here as a fall, not against wind. There's a lot we can do together. Thanks very much. Um... I have a question from Erin McCulloch, who's a co-chair of the Australia-Japan Youth Dialogue. Uh, she thanks you for your talk today and, and uh, wonders, uh, what role can young people play right now to strengthen the Australia-Japan relationship, uh, particularly since many young people can't engage like they usually do uh, through going on exchanges or traveling or the JET program and so on? 
Uh, and perhaps uh, if I can add um, the theme from a couple of other questions, uh, in particular, uh, you know, what can we be doing as we come out of COVID to sort of really energize that process of exchange? Mm -hmm. Well, as uh, somebody who is approaching you know, uh, the birthday to wear a red jacket, I count a lot on younger generations. And uh, they are the hope uh, of our two nations. Uh, especially, you know, I would like to emphasize the significance of this project of you know, JET program. Uh, there are a number of Aussies you know, uh, who have been to and who are you know, going to Japan uh, to teach English at Japanese schools. And they come back to Australia with a fair amount of you know, knowledge and experiences uh, you know, regarding uh, Japan. And they are becoming the driving force behind the promotion of our bilateral relationship. Uh, by the same token, I count a lot on you know young Japanese you know people uh, who are willing to you know, go overseas. Actually, you know when whenever I read you know uh, some uh, you know media story uh, in the West, uh, some people have a misperception that Japanese youngsters are not willing to go overseas, but. If you look at people like, you know, uh, Otani Shohei, or a golfer, you know, Matsuyama Hideki, or Osaka Naomi, tennis player, or those, you know, skateboarders, or those surfers who got medals in the Tokyo Olympics, you know, you have to share that, you know, stereotype. So I think it's up to us, all the generation people, to improve the environment so that, you know, those young generation people you know, are more, you know, willing to come overseas, especially to a country like Australia, where there is a great potential for us to promote our bilateral relationship. Thanks very much. Um, from someone who hasn't given their name, uh, thank you for your inspiring and optimistic speech. Uh, regarding the hydrogen industry going forward, uh, do you think there's a chance that Japanese automakers would recommence manufacturing in Australia of hydrogen or maybe electric motor vehicles? We, uh, we all remember uh, the history of uh, you know, uh, Japanese automakers you know, trying to produ you know, produce cars you know, here in Australia. And... Uh, uh, they are the you know uh, last ones. They are the ones to have stayed until last minute. They did every kind of effort. So uh, I don't, uh, in a nutshell, uh, it is up to uh, their you know business decision. But having said that, uh, the reason I emphasize you know the last is they are here not for making short term profit. They are here. You know, to make a long-term commitment to forge, you know, long-term business relationship. So, you know, uh, I dream of a day when, you know, uh, Japanese automakers, you know, could produce, you know, uh, their, you know, automobiles or their parts here. But that said, uh, another aspect uh, we would like to, you know, focus on is Australia is already closely you know ingrained into this network supply chains and network of you know products and services throughout in the pacific for example if you look at the you know toyota car you know driven here on the australian streets you know uh, most of them are produced either in japan or in thailand that means the uh, importance of you know economic integration like CPTPP, where Australia and Japan have been taking the leadership. So yes, uh, let us talk about Australian economy, but also you know, let us together talk about regional economy as a whole and Australia and Japan uh, in the driving seat. Thanks, and that, that actually touches on a point which I often uh, like to make myself, which is that when we think about this relationship, we actually have to think about it not just as uh, a bilateral question of how much we sell to you or how much you sell to us. Uh, you know, we, we actually import a lot of 
stuff which is made by Japan, not necessarily in Japan, but it's still a very vital part of our, of our bilateral uh, economic relationship as well. Um, I have a question from Manuel Panayotopoulos from the uh, Australia-Japan Economic Institute, um, who I'm sure is well known to you. Oh, yes. uh, could you comment on the ways that uh, grassroots organizations such as Australia-Japan societies, sister cities and so on, uh, can continue to complement the strong business ties that we have? And what's their importance? Well, I couldn't, you know, no, my, my simple answer is uh, I couldn't emphasize more the importance of, you know, grassroots uh, level ties between Australia and Japan. After all, you know, anybody, you know, who's been to Japan will understand the real strength of Japan rests with ordinary people. No, Richard, you know, you have served in Tokyo as well. And you know, you know, I was once told you know, this by, you know, my good, uh, you know, Korean friend. Uh, he didn't pay high regard to, you know, Japanese bureaucrats. He didn't pay high regard to Japanese celebrities. But he said, Japanese ordinary people is quite something. And we have seen those examples in the volunteers of Tokyo 2020. They made you know, the foundation for the successful holding in a safe and secure manner of the Tokyo Olympics. So uh, when it comes to, you know, looking at, you know, forging ties with these ordinary people, yes, sister city, you know, relationship or sister prefecture relationship is important and, you know, endeavor, you know, uh, made by people like Manuel, you know, speaks a lot. And uh, so uh, I'd like to see more of you know, these robust you know, uh, exchanges uh, taking place as soon as the travel limit is taken off, as soon as the COVID gets under a reasonable control. Thank you very much, Ambassador. We, uh, we have, as you might expect, a very large number of questions coming through, and I'm conscious that time is also uh, a little bit limited, but um, uh, maybe if I could just um, uh, finish with, with one um, big picture question, and we would like to pass to you the other questions which have been ask, asked, and maybe we can look at whether we can get some uh, comments back from you, which we could go back to people with uh, in, in some other way or, or on our um, website. Uh, so um, last big picture question, um, again, from someone who will be well known to you, Bruce Miller, the former Australian ambassador in, uh, in Tokyo. Um, what do you envisage the Australia-Japan relationship will look like in 10 years time? Uh, and what will determine its trajectory? Now you have about two minutes to answer that one. <laughs> Although you could have two hours. <laughs> well, the simple answer is, you know, sky is the limit. And uh, I'm so excited to be here as Japanese ambassador to Australia at this critical, critical juncture of our bilateral relationship uh, at this time of history. So now we are building on this economic complementarity of trade and investment relationship to you know, further promote our cooperation you know, in other areas, including defense security cooperation, intelligence, you know, people to people exchanges. So uh, like I said in my speech today, Japan and Australia are natural partners and sky is the limit. That's great. Thank you very much. Well, we are unfortunately out of time. We've got a lot of uh, questions uh, still there. Um, and if I could flag in particular, probably there are a number of questions around um, small business and how we can get more small business, FinTech, uh, those kinds of links going. Um, maybe we can uh, find a way of, of, of getting some kind of uh, comment from you on that and, uh, and putting it up on our website. But for now, um, I'd like to thank you very much indeed. Uh, that's been a very informative and, and useful um, uh, conversation. And I'd like just now to pass back to Peter Gray to say a few words at the end of this. At least I think I'm going to, but I can't. Uh, we seem to be having a. Okay. Am I back? Hopefully I'm back. The, um, 
so, so, thank you very much, uh, Ambassador. I won't say anything more. I think your speech and it's both the content and the way you present uh, is incredibly refreshing and, and no one will leave here other than being completely impressed by your performance and look forward to catching up with you at a, at a different stage. I think uh, if you'd allow me, uh, and that's the thing I'm going to, to sort of put in a bit of a plug here, particularly in regard to the last question, which related to uh, small business and fintech, there's one answer and it rests with uh, Richard uh, here, uh, because what the uh, Australia-Japan uh, Business Corporation Committee is trying to do is expand our, uh, our uh, role, including with small business and uh, helping Australian small business in a broad sense to, uh, to engage with Japan. Uh, we do have coming up shortly in early October, uh, our joint conference between the Australia-Japan Business Corporation Committee and the Japanese equivalent. Uh, even though unfortunately we've had to go on, so this is yeah, in October, it, it's had to go online, uh, but we will still have it. And I would urge all those of you who uh, are not members of uh, the Australia Japan Business Cooperation Committee uh, to uh, talk to, to Richard afterwards, email him, bombard him with telephone calls, uh, because for a very modest fee, uh, you can enjoy, you can join that organisation, and I can assure you, you get. Uh, great value out of it. Uh, it has the support of uh, very senior people in the Australian business side. It has the strong support, for example, of Dan Tien, uh, the trade minister. Dan will be at that uh, conference. Uh, I know Ambassador Yamagami is also a strong supporter and uh, will be attending that particular conference. So um, that's that's the next immediate step along the way is, is our conference. and. Uh, uh, we thank you, Ambassador, for your presentation today. We thank you for your incredibly strong uh, uh, support for the relationship, your very open and personable approach to it all, uh, and uh, look forward to keeping in touch and, uh, and uh, having you back again for a further session, perhaps on a, on a reasonably regular basis, if that's possible. So thank you, and thank you to everyone who's joined in and to our support staff who have helped the uh, technically incompetent such as myself to uh, find their way through yet another webinar. So thank you, Trudy. Thank you, Richard. And thank you, Ambassador Yamagami. Thank you very much, Peter, for having me. Thank you. Well, on, on that note, uh, that concludes the webinar. And, and again, I'd like to thank uh, all of you for attending. Uh, we will try to get back to as many of you as possible with answers to the questions that we weren't able to ask. And, and in, uh, at the end, again, uh, thank you very much indeed, Ambassador, for your time and, and for your uh, wonderful presentation. Thanks a lot, Richard.